there should be no state and local tax cap at all because every one of those dollars should be influencing the um, the taxpayer dollars should be influencing their decisions. You shouldn't be able to write them off on your federal level because what that does is it shifts the burden from lo uh, lower tax states to higher tax states to pay for them over time. So it's a subsidy of high tax states. They should feel the full brunt of their bad policies of more spending and taxes and not pushing that on to lower taxes. Hello, welcome to this week's economy. I'm your host, Dr. Vance Ginn. Thank you for joining me today. Well, today is October 20th, 2023. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Please go and subscribe, leave a review, rate it, whatever you need to do. Please help me out in this process as I'm trying to reach the masses with this information that's providing valuable insights for you, the listener, each week. Also remember that you can find all this information at vancegin.com along with my you know, updates throughout every day on x.com at Vance Ginn, my website, vanceginn.com. So that's a lot of places you can find me, but you know a lot of this stuff already if you're a frequent listener, and I appreciate that. So keep it going and share it with your friends and family. Remember the Let People Prosper episode that comes out on Mondays, the most recent one had Ben Murray of the Independence Institute that we talked about Colorado's economy the Taxpayer's Bill of Rights, which is a spending limit that every state should have based on population growth plus inflation and ultimately at the federal level. And we also talked about populism from the left and the right of the political spectrum and what it means for you. It's not good. This upcoming Lepio Prosper episode on Monday will be with Texas State Representative Brian Harrison. He has been on as a chief economist at the Health and Human Services in D.C. during the Trump administration. He was there during the COVID situation and what happened during that period. We had a good conversation about that. And he was also in favor of eliminating property taxes and passing universal school choice in Texas and elsewhere, which I am too. These are good things that really need to happen. And so I hope that you'll listen to that episode coming up. So let's get right into it with the top news and policy issues happening for you and how it influences you. On the national front, I was recently on Fox Business talking about the economic uncertainty in the economy from dysfunction in Congress, right? They can't pick a speaker by the Republicans. Thought it was going to be Scalise last week. Well, that fell through. Then Representative Jim Jordan, he went up for a vote. That fell through as well. And so now it's kind of like, who's going to be it next? Um, I heard... And this is reported that Representative Jim Jordan is talking about raising the SALT cap, which is the state and local tax cap of $10,000 up to $20,000 to basically buy off the New York Republicans to win their votes. And that's bad principle, bad policy. I actually don't think that the SALT should even exist. There should be no state and local tax cap cap at all because every one of those dollars should be influencing the um, the taxpayer dollars should be influencing their decisions. You shouldn't be able to write them off on your federal level because what that does is it shifts the burden from lo uh, lower tax states to higher tax states to pay for them over time. So it's a subsidy of high tax states. They should feel the full brunt of their bad policies of more spending and taxes and not pushing that on to lower taxes. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but really that hurts a lot of the red states and helps a lot of the blue states. And so this is a bad idea, but we'll see what else happens throughout this. You know, we've also had the foreign policy issues, what's going on in Israel and Hamas and um, what's happening there. And just a lot of unfortunate situation with many innocent people dying in the process. I hate to see it. War is not, never should be the result of anything, in my view. And, and But this is what's happening right now. And I'm hopeful and praying for the best situation possible there. We also have the situation going on in Russia and Ukraine. Just a lot of things that are going on that makes a lot of economic uncertainty in the economy, which we're feeling that in the markets, from the stock market, bond market, interest rates continue to soar. We're still seeing you know, the 10-year treasury rate is the highest since 2007 of close to 5%. Mortgage rates, 8%. The highest since I think is 2000, so 23 years. And so we're still seeing some massive increases in interest rates, which are influencing Main Street and everybody and families and individuals. I mean, you're feeling it too, I'm sure. And that's what we're seeing across the spectrum. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell recently gave some remarks and indicated that he's going to extend his pause in that target interest rate, the federal funds rate, overnight lending rate between banks. That's currently 5.5%, right in that range right there. And so that's what, what he said he's going to probably keep it there, given that inflationary pressures are coming down. Inflation rate, you know, the latest one at 3.7%. 
Um, but we'll see if that continues. If they also look at their core where they exclude food and energy, that's something else that they're seeing is coming down as well. So I think they're starting to hear more of their targets, but they don't want there to be more uh, higher interest rates. And But from them, that's going to dampen or weaken the economy more. But look, I think a lot of this is smoke and mirrors. I mean, they've really got to focus on their balance sheet, as I've talked about numerous times and will continue to because that's the ultimate way forward. I got a couple pieces coming out soon. Uh, hopefully that will talk more about this, but something to check out there. Home sales continue to slide. The slowest pace since 2010 is high rates and price squeezes the housing market. We have housing prices that are also reaching record highs, continue to, to see heights there. And so that's not a, a good sign as it's making it more costly and with higher interest rates, even more costly for monthly payments. And so when you look at these median home values and you think about what the interest rates are going to be, property taxes, all the other things that people are going to be paying for monthly, it's making it very costly, unaffordable for many of these people to, um, to, to buy a home. And, and so I think that this is something that's going to continue to creep throughout the economy and leaving an unsustainable situation for families and businesses, especially when you also include credit card debt out there where interest rates on those are also soaring to close to 20 plus percent, right? And so that's something else that's going to be dampening people's ability to, to prosper. And this is not a good situation for them, for businesses and the overall economy. And so I, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. For the state side of things, um, you know, I'm still following a lot of stuff what's going on in Texas. They have their special session going on. It's been in place for a couple of weeks now. The Senate passed a lot of their but their bills related to the issues pertaining to the special session that was called by Governor Greg Abbott. But the main one that I want to focus on, of course, is this idea of universal school choice, universal education savings accounts, which should be for every parent to be able to decide where they want to send their children so that it's going to meet their unique needs. Whatever schooling that's going to be, whether it's the government school, the private school, homeschool, tutoring, co-ops, they should have the choice. We should not be so focused on a government school system. We should be focused on people, that the people are the ones we really want to help out. And the government school system spending more money on this, as some of the Democrats and even some moderate Republicans in Texas and across the country want to do, is not the result. When we were spending much less, that we're getting much better outcomes than the higher amount that we're spending today, which are record amounts in per, per student funding and even inflation adjusted funding, um, we're not seeing improvement in outcomes. There's not a correlation there. And therefore, we do not need to be spending more money. In fact, when we get universal education saving accounts, each one of those dollars that flow out, meaning parents decide to send their kids elsewhere because they don't feel like their government school is very competitive, that money should also flow out of the, the state's budget and, and go to that other school to where there's not an increase in the overall amount of spending. And at the end of the day, I think that's what the market will tell us, how much we should actually be spending on education across any state, not based on government decisions from a top-down approach, but from a bottom-up approach in the process. And I talked about this with Chad Hasty of the Chad Hasty Show up in Lubbock, uh, where I went to school in Texas Tech. And he's a great discussion there. I put a, I'll put a link in the show notes, but that's another good place to check out. There was some also good discussion around on X.com. Dan Mitchell had a good blog post about this at International Liberty. But basically, it talks about how just like the more spending on government school, school systems don't work, neither does it work to reduce poverty. As New York and California, which have some of the highest poverty rates when you look at the supplemental poverty measure and other measures that are out there, are, is spend, are spending more than twice as much on per capita welfare spending than places like Texas and Florida which had to have lower poverty. And so those are things that we need to look at. And so it's not how much you spend, it's about how it's spent, what's the overall economic situation and things of that nature. And at the same time, Florida and New York are two of the highest states that have the highest amount of net out migration across the states. And, and they spend about twice as much per capita in government spending than do places like Texas and Florida, which have some of the most net in migration. And so spending, again, is not the answer. We need less government in the system. I uh, also wanted to note in Louisiana, we had Republican Jeff Landry, who won the race for governor, flipping it from D to R. So that's something we want to continue to watch. He has put a focus on tax relief, which remember, we came up with the tax relief plan from the Pelican Institute. He's also been in favor of universal school choice. That's something else that's a big part of the comeback agenda by the Pelican Institute. So something to watch there. And, and finally, on the state side, don't miss the information on the Sustainable Budget Project and Americans for Tax Reform. A lot of great information there for every state, for lawmakers, for staff, for individuals to even check out what's going on. Really check that out. 
And finally, in other news, you look, I think that there's a lot of talk about manufacturing and the manufacturing sector needs to be supported by more government spend, uh, spending, subsidies, tax breaks, whatever we can do in order to make a level playing field in some capacity with other countries and everything else. But I really think that the way to get more robust manufacturing will, if that is even necessary to do, is with less government, not more, as the national conservatives and the populists claim. This is one reason why I was so you know, happy to be an original signatory of the Freedom Conservative Statement of Principles, which basically is like, look, we need to get government out of the way, not have more government. And there's this idea of conservative economics. I don't know what that means, but they're trying to push this idea that it means more government influence in our economy when government is the problem. You can't make two, two wrongs, don't make it right, okay? We've got to get over that idea, and we've got to be able to push back as free market folks to say, you know what? This is not the path forward. This has already been tried in places like China <laughs> from communism and more government. And in times when we've had excessive government, just like today in the United States, we're going to look back and say that these were bad ideas and we should not go down this road. Let's learn from the lessons of the mistakes from, from what's happened in America and other countries and not do them again. And finally, it was great to see my friends down in Austin, Texas, Corey DeAngelis, who's a fighter of li for liberty of education school choice, and also George Martinez of the um, Libre Initiative. He was also down there, saw them, and it was great to catch up with them. They're doing some great work. And so there are many people that are out there that are fighting for our liberty. And uh, I just wanted to bring you to their attention. So that's what I got for you today. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Um, let's try to think optimistically. Let's try to find ways to overcome the obstacles that are in our way. And too often it's government. And, and too often... We, we, we become dependent on government when government should be the last line of defense, not the first line of defense. People, churches, synagogues, civil society is really where the action needs to be taking place. And that is how we let people prosper. So until next time on this week's economy, have a wonderful weekend. Let people prosper.